have uh, some very special guests with us. And uh, my husband and I actually met them face to face for the first time today when we picked them up from the airport. Uh, we've spoken several times and prayed over the phone together. And uh, so I, I just, I, I actually have, have this uh, short biography that I hung on the bulletin board as well, along with the announcements of this weekend, which none of you probably read because you don't look at the bulletin board <laughs> like you're supposed to, but I'll share a little bit about, about them with you. Uh, Steve and Ernie Sims live in Nashville, Tennessee, from the South, and they've been married for 33 years. They have a 30-year-old daughter named Amelia. Steve spent the first part of his career as a motivational speaker while helping to start and pastor several churches. Ernie was a trainer and facilitator in the corporate world. 20 years ago, Steve began working as the counselor and chaplain for the Salvation Army ARC in Nashville. So he knows the program very well. He spent five and a half years speaking nightly, counseling men and leading Bible studies and prayer groups. Shortly thereafter, Ernie became the director of a Salvation Army community center. Eventually, the Salvation Army asked them to open up a closed down core church in the highest crime area in Nashville. And for the next 10 years, they built the ministry on the model of a recovery support group featuring heartfelt sharing, um, testimonies, caring interaction, and prayer for freedom. Steve wrote a book about it called Beyond Church and has written five other books. He blogs daily at hopethoughts.com. You may want to check it out and brings hope and encouragement while speaking the truth about Jesus Christ. He is known for his direct approach and clever sense of humor. We're looking forward to that. Steve and Ernie are currently enjoying learning to swing dance. Will we get a demonstration this weekend? <laughs> I hope so. Steve is also learning Spanish and Ernie to play the ukulele. So um, I'm really looking forward to uh, um, receiving all that God has laid upon their hearts. And um, we'll, we'll share a little bit more about um, what's specifically what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and then, of course, on Sunday morning. Um, so, and uh, maybe you probably know more. But no, never. You probably don't know more than I do. But you may know we are having a special event over in the the dining room and the area over there for Major B, the fundraiser for her daughter-in-law. So um, you'll have, be having breakfast over there as usual, as far as I know. But lunch will be served over, like in the canteen area in the residence. And then for dinner, we'll be uh, ordering pizza um, over there because they'll be having their, um, their special event over there. So, so please be respectful. There'll be guests uh, on our campus here. So um, let's be respectful and we'll welcome them and, and uh, we will go about our business. All right, so we are going to continue. We'll sing together this next song and then we will have prayer. And then I'm gonna turn it over to our guests. So let's sing together, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness. That is who our God is. So you can stand if you feel led as we worship together. Here we go. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're turning light. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 
Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Amen. That is who he is. You may be seated. Um, Ask my husband to pray with us. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. You are the way maker and you've made a way for us to be here in your presence this evening. And we pray that we would be able to put aside for this time all distractions and all thoughts that would lead us from your presence, Lord. We pray that we would have ears that are tuned into your voice we pray that the enemy's voice would be silenced even to beyond the edge of this property, that this place, this property is declared kingdom territory. And we pray that you, we know that you rule and reign, but we pray that you would just clean up all the atmosphere, clean up the clutter in our minds, in our thoughts, the distractions now, and help us, Lord, to hear clearly all that you have to say to us, because you are speaking Help us to be listening. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing and what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, good evening. Good to see all you guys. Got to shake hands with a few of you earlier. Uh, my name is Steve, and this is my wife, Ernie. So uh, she is a, a lady, as you can see. And uh, let's see. Uh, some people get confused. They'll remember Ernie's name, and then they call me Bert. And, uh, you know, I know Bert and Ernie were a famous duo, but we're Steve and Ernie. So uh, you, you ever have downtime and don't quite know what to do? Uh, what do you do when you got, you know, an hour or two and you don't know what to do? Any, any ideas? What do you do? Like, you've got... Two hours, nothing to do. Anybody take a nap? Yeah. Anybody ever say uh, pray or read the Bible? A few people. Uh, anybody ever watch a little TV? Yeah, just, you know, how about get on your phone? Watch some YouTube stuff. Well, uh, I, one of the things I like to do when I don't know what to do is walk. And so I'll, I'll walk a lot, cause I guess, because I don't know what to do a lot. <laughs> so uh, we got here this afternoon. We're from Nashville, and uh, you may notice my southern twang a little bit. And uh, I was like, okay, we got a couple of hours. What should I do? I thought, well, I'll just go for a walk. Any of you ever gone out the gate here and taken a ride? So I went out the gate, took a ride, and walked until I came to another street. and. I couldn't believe it. It's all empty buildings. Every I was just like, 
There's an empty building, there's an empty building, there's an empty building, there's an empty building. Where did the people go? You, you know, Christians believe in a rapture and God takes everybody up, you know. And I thought, wow, is, you know, has God come and taken everybody away? Where is everybody? And these buildings are not run down. They look nice, like they were the home of successful businesses. And I'm like, what's going on? So I came to a street way on down there and took a right. And there was another street, another big, long block of just empty buildings. So is everybody moved out of here? What are we doing? Maybe we should leave too. <laughs> and then I took another right and I saw a huge steeple. You know that big steeple over there? You know, and, and I walked the street and there was this building on my right that was empty, but it was looked hopeful. Those other buildings just seemed lonesome to me and empty and forlorn. I didn't see any hope. But when I turned that corner uh, where that steeple is, the building on my right, there was construction equipment all around it and some heavy equipment with the big wheels. And I was like, wow, it's just as empty as the other buildings, but I see hope in that building. I saw no hope in the other buildings. They were just empty. But then that building, there was hope. And I looked across the street, and there was a cross on the top of that steeple. I don't know if you've ever seen that cross. And I don't know if you know, but on this side of the building, there's an angel. You know, there's a big, I, I wanted to go in there. There was a big fence. I wanted to see if I was as big as the angel. <laughs> uh, it looked pretty big. It might be, you know. But it was sitting over against the building and, and facing the, the building with all the construction. And I think people are like these buildings down this street. Uh, I think we find ourselves empty a lot. You know, you ever feel empty? You know, just kind of lonesome, like nobody's noticing you, you know, like my life is not really that important. I think that's common of humanity, you know, to feel empty. But then when I turned the corner and saw that other building across from the church, with, with all the heavy construction, there wasn't a person there, but somebody is investing a lot of money in that building to put all that heavy construction. And there was some uh, green, you know, the, the green stuff they put when they're, you know, adding onto buildings. And I could tell they were either just started or they're about to start working on that building. And so that building has hope. So which are you? You know, we're all feel like empty buildings at times. At times, when you feel like an empty building, are, are, are you feeling like you're the empty building with no hope, nobody willing to invest in you, nobody believing in you? Maybe you're even having trouble believing yourself that your life can be better. Are you like the, the building over here with all this equipment and uh, getting ready for a remodel? You know, there wasn't much going on yet, and there was nothing happening today, but I can tell that building is getting ready for a remodel, and I believe every one of you are getting ready for a remodel. Amen. And God wants to remodel you from the inside out. He wants to change you and empower you. There's so much more. Life offers so much more. No human being except Jesus Christ, but no other human being has ever maxed out life. Nobody. Nobody's like, okay, man, I'm having such a good life and everything's going, and I'm, I'm just, this is so good. My life could never be better. You know, sometimes you say, how are you? Couldn't be better. That's a lie. Everybody could be better. I mean, somebody that couldn't be better, you know, they're lying to you. You know, you, we can be better. We can have more. There's more for you. There's more for you. God wants more for you. And hopefully you want more for you. There's more peace for you. Inner peace. You know, sometimes we think, well, I want more money. But then you see people who have a lot of money and they're pretty miserable sometimes. Money won't make you happy. But love is a good thing. God has more love for you. God has more hope for you. God has better relationships with your family for you. God has... Uh, a closer relationship with him and with Jesus Christ for you. And hopefully this weekend, you know, I can help encourage you a little bit to believe that there's more. 
that there's so much more. You, you, you know, you, you can, you, you very, have barely scratched the surface. I've very, barely scratched the surface for what God wants in my life. And this is a coloring book. It's called a magic coloring book, but there's nothing magic about it. It's an illusion. And uh, it shows the way people, the way we live our lives. Many of us, you know, we're, we're just kind of hopeless and we flip through our life and we just don't see much hope. We see a lot of brokenness and discouragement and, uh, and, and, and that kind of thing. And that's okay to be honest and say my life, and you guys have been honest, you know, to come into a rehab program, you've admitted that there's a lot of this in your life. And that took courage. It takes courage to say, there's a lot of this in my life. The people who crucified Jesus in the Bible, uh, that turned him over to the Romans, they were called Pharisees. And they were the most religious people. You know, and you find, I'm from the South, and of course that's called the Bible Belt, but not so much because there's great spirituality there, but because there's great religion big churches and, 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 and you have to act certain ways and, you know, a lot of pretense and pride. And a lot of the, the Pharisees could not admit, I'm broken. You know, in the first step, you come to realize that you need something or someone to restore you to sanity and to even admit that, that you've got these problems. So I commend every one of you and I admire you because you're courageous. You're courageous, but how much are you using that courage? You use the courage to get in here. Don't abandon it now. Uh, have you ever heard, what is the, the greatest fear that pe human beings have? Has anybody ever heard what that is? What? Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown. Fear of the unknown, that's a big one. Public speaking. That, yeah, I've read many times the greatest fear it's the fear of public speaking. But well, I'm not afraid up here. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, I might start being afraid <laughs> and being nervous. But I don't believe that. I mean, I, when I was a kid, I was scared to death to speak in public. And uh, in my middle school, I had to give reports every six weeks in front of the class. Uh, and, my, and a girl I had a crush on was in there. And I would, my knees would knock and I, I, I couldn't talk. And I thought I was really bad and, you know, so hopefully I've improved a little, but that's not what I think the greatest fear is. I believe the greatest fear that any human has is the fear of being found out. The fear that somebody's gonna see what's really going on in your mind and in your heart. I think the greatest fear known to mankind is the fear of opening up your heart and letting people see and that's where the, the AA and NA have excelled because they try to create an environment where people can safely open up their heart and they try to connect people with someone who's a little bit ahead of them. They don't try to find an expert who has a PhD in addiction uh, recovery. You know, what good would that do? Now, this is what you need to do. Four points, you know, that I've learned in my PhD of recovery from addiction. I mean, that's not going to help you, but AA matches you with a guy or, you know, a woman of the same, you know, whatever, you, whoever you are, they match you with somebody like you. Uh, and uh, this person isn't an expert. It's somebody who's been just as addicted as you, but it's somebody who has a month six months, a year, five years, more sobriety than you do. They're a little bit further ahead. And AA teaches people to open up and be real uh, with your sponsor and with each other. So here's a big book. This book is about courage. It's about the courage to open your heart. And that's what this weekend I want to focus on is the courage to open your heart. Be courageous. If you want more, you got to open up your heart. So let me show you. you and you got to want more, you know, and not be content with this. You know, it's easy to be content with that, but there's more. Yeah, there's more than that. You know, don't just be stuck on, okay, I'm pretty miserable. I've had a hard life. You know, but dare to believe that there's more. 
And that your light can have more. Be courageous enough to believe that there's more for you. Is anybody willing to dare to believe that there's more? I challenge you. Believe that there's more. If you won't believe in yourself, why do you expect John to? Is that the right time? No, it's not. Reverend Dr. Cheers. You know, but why do you expect your counselors to? And then, you know, if you're willing to expect that I can go from this to this, I dare you to step out and believe that you can go to this. That you can have a life full of color and beauty. No matter how many years your life has been like this, dare to believe that if you'll open your heart up, God can help you make your life something great, something beyond imagination. Now, uh, that total change be can begin in an instant. That's what happened to me. But it doesn't all happen in an instant. It takes years. I, I, I grew up very insecure. Uh, I had a mom who was just nervous, and, and, and uh, she was an addict, but she never got addicted to drugs and alcohol. She was addicted to worry. She was addicted to negativity, coffee. You go into her uh, house and there was all sorts of junk food everywhere. She would drink coffee from morning till night. She would smoke cigarettes all day. And she was just would, would, was struggling with depression, and as a little kid, I, I, I was you know feeling those same things, and I decided I don't want to feel this way, and started trying to you know to to find a way to feel better, and not to feel, let that negativity that captured my mom capture me. And for some reason, as a little kid, I believed in God. I don't know where that came from because my parents did not go to church and you know they'd been raised in Christian churches but they weren't in they seemed to have no interest and as a little kid I started asking them to take me to church and they resisted for years and finally when I was about 10 or 11 they um, my dad's sister said she had started to a Presbyterian church and said, hey, maybe you and your family would like this. So my dad took us to visit a Presbyterian church, and it wasn't what I was expecting. It was stand up, sit down, stand up, read this reading. The preacher would pray like, dear God, we beseech thee this morning that thou wouldst bless this congregation with thy presence. And he would be reading it. And that wasn't my experience. To me, God was real. I'd talk to him and, you know, just, you know, and... and the bad thing was, is after that first Sunday, I didn't want to go back, but my dad kept going, my, my mom, and they made me and my two brothers go. And what re really made it bad is before long, they asked my dad, he was a radio announcer with a good voice, and I guess he could sound like a preacher, and they asked him to start teaching a Sunday school class. Well, he didn't really even believe that much, but they asked him to teach, and so then we were stuck. I had to go every Sunday, and. They stuck me in this little class to indoctrinate me, and I went through this whole class, and then they, you know, at the end, they baptized me by sprinkling and made me say these things, and I actually felt a little tear, you know, and I believed in God, but I didn't sense God in any of that for some reason. But you know what they did? They made me think I was a Christian. You're now a Christian. And I thought, well, I guess I am. I'm a Presbyterian, so I guess that makes me a Christian. And so from that point on, I thought I was a Christian. When I was working at the Nashville ARC one time, these words came to my mind. The most dangerous place a human being can be is to think they are right with God when they're not. Because if you think you're right with God, oh yeah, well, always interviewing uh, men when they would come into the Nashville ARC, I would ask them, you know, are you right with God? Oh yeah, I was saved, 11 years old to join the church and I'm saved. Or I got, you know, saved in a revival when I was 22, got baptized. And were you just telling me, you know, about a month ago you stole from your grandmother? Well, yeah. I said, does that sound like Christianity? Well, no. I, I, so are you sure? Oh yeah, I'm sure. You know, just because a preacher tells you you're saved, that doesn't mean you're saved. If there's not been a drastic, radical uh, change inside of you, you're just whistling Dixie, even if you're a Yankee. 
<laughs> That's a joke, okay? <laughs> Don't all, you know, I'm just kidding. Uh, but there's a real change. So I, I didn't have that change, but I thought I was a Christian. And a few years later, when I was in high school, I was sitting in church one morning, yawning through the sermon. And all of a sudden, a thought came into my mind. If you were born a Hindu, what would you be today? I was probably 16, 17. And I thought, what a weird thought. If I was born a Hindu, you know, Hindus are a religion of India. They believe there are millions of gods and, you know, monkeys are gods and rats are gods and they have temples. And I thought, started thinking, what if I was raised in India? And I started asking my parents, hey, I want to know God better. And they had taken me to a Hindu temple and the Hindu priest had run me through some rituals and then maybe sprinkled a little water on me and said, welcome to Hinduism. I was like, wow, if that's all I had ever known, then I would be a Hindu. That's, I said that to myself. And all of a sudden the thought came to my mind, why do you think you're a Christian? And I was like, the only reason I think I'm a Christian it's because I went through some rituals and got sprinkled in the baptized in the church, and but nothing happened inside of me. And then I was like, what do I believe? What do I believe that's not been pushed on me by others? Have you noticed around the world, most people, almost everybody, 99% of humanity claims to be the religion they grew up in? Have you ever noticed that? In Saudi Arabia, almost everybody's a Muslim. In India, almost everybody's a Hindu. You know, in uh, European countries now, they, you know, they're you know, in America. Used to in America, every, most everybody thought they were a Christian. You know, at least now, people aren't pretending to be when they're not. But do you have the courage to look at your heart and answer that question? Honestly, if you were raised a Hindu and that's all you had ever known, what religion would you say you are? And if you say, well, I would, uh, I, would have been a, I would be a Hindu if that's all I'd ever know. That's the honest answer. Why are 99% of the people raised in Hinduism Hindus? Because they've never thought of anything else. Why are 99% of the people raised in Islam Muslims? People raised in Christians? Because they've never started to, to wonder, what's the reality of this? What's the reality of it? So uh, uh, that day, I just thought about it. I thought, I'm not a Christian. What do I really believe no matter how I was raised? Would I believe in Jesus? No, I wouldn't believe in Jesus if I'd been raised a Hindu. Would I believe in the Bible was the Word of God? No, I'd be believing in the Gita. That's the Hindu holy book. And, you know, what? do I believe Jesus rose from the dead? I have no reason to believe that. Preacher told me it was so, but it doesn't mean anything to me. And I kept stripping down, stripping down, stripping down. What do I really believe? And I finally got, what about a creator? And it's like, I believe that since I was a little kid. I believe that since I was just looking at, you know, I don't know who's got the most magnificent body in the room, <laughs> but looking at any human body, if, if you study human anatomy, you know, you look at your hand and you see the vessels and, and you cut yourself and you bleed and, 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 and you feel your heart beating and, and you, you, you're thinking thoughts and you're feeling emotion and you're like, how could this just happen? How could my body just, you know, oh, billions of years, you know, nothing, time and chance produced everything? I've never been able to believe that. And so I thought that day, I believe there's some kind of creator. I don't know who he is or what he is, but I don't believe all this happened for ac by accident. So I just said that day, okay, God, I've always believed in you. I don't know who or what you are, but whatever you are or whoever you are, will you show me the truth? I don't believe in Jesus. don't believe in the Bible. Uh, but I want to know who are you or what are you? And about two years later, I was a freshman in college, and a guy kept inviting me to this Christian meeting. And I was like, hey, I'm not a Christian, and, you know, I appreciate it, and he wouldn't leave me alone. So I finally went, and something happened that night, and all these years later, it still stirs me up. It didn't satisfy me. It made me hungry. You know, if your religion satisfies you, you probably don't have the real deal. Jesus said, blessed are those who are satisfied, right? No. 
He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, righteousness doesn't mean being a goody two shoes and, you know, your shoes are untied. Don't you have any respect? You know, you're crossing the middle line. You know, it doesn't mean being a, you know, you, you know, you said a cuss word. You better be quiet. That's not righteousness. Righteousness is f being right on the inside. You know, when you're struggling with addiction, you know something's off. And I've never been uh, addicted to drugs or alcohol, but I've known something wasn't right in me. And righteousness is, is to hunger, to be right on the inside. I'm not talking just about moral righteousness, but I'm talking about to be functionally right. So you can get up in the morning and smile like Mark. Man, I got enjoyed talking to Mark. He's a happy guy. And I love people like that. But when you start to let your insides get right, uh, things start to happen. Now, anybody go to the dentist every now and then, maybe once a decade? <laughs> uh, they say six months for some reason. I missed an appointment uh, about a year ago. My dentist is so crowded, I had to wait another six months. That was really weird. I was glad to get them clean. When I went in the dentist office, you know what he told me? What does the dentist say when you sit in his chair? He says, open your mouth. And I'm like, why do you want my mouth to open? And he says, I can't do anything to help you if you keep your mouth closed. Well, maybe I will later. He said, I don't have time. I'm making this up, but that's kind of what I, <laughs> I need you to open your mouth now. Well, give me time and let me think about it, and I'll get back to you. Like, if you want this appointment, get that mouth open. You know, a dentist can't help you. He can't help your teeth unless you'll open your mouth. Did you know God can't help you unless you open your heart? You can keep your heart closed. Well, I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. Well, sure. I'm a, I'm a Tennessee Titans fan. I'm up here, there are probably not many. Uh, and I don't blame them because this year they're not looking like they're going to be very good. But did you guys ever see clips of the running back Derrick Henry when he runs and, you know, when a cornerback tries to tackle him, he goes boom. And he's like 250 or 260 pounds, and that little cornerback's like 190. And when Henry hits them with that arm, they'll go flying backwards. And uh, that's the way a lot of people do God. You know, they're running along here, they're like, boom! I go, and then they, I pray, and God didn't help me. Well, could you, you know, it's, it, you might as well say, I went to the dentist and he didn't help me. Well, why not? Because I wouldn't open my mouth. And so it takes courage to open your mouth in the dentist. Some people are deathly afraid of the dentist. Did you know that? And uh, unfortunately, I've never been afraid. That drill makes me a little uncomfortable. <laughs> like, <laughs> But uh, I'm willing to do it. But, it, you know, many people are afraid to open their hearts to God. God wants you to experience the good things. Now, in our life, you know, we're, we're, as human beings, we're kind of born feeling good. Okay, we're born feeling, you know, you know, clean. You know, a newborn baby's innocent. Uh, but as you grow up, things start to happen, right? And before you know it, you've got something attached to you. Maybe it's a bad habit, bad attitude. You're like, man, what happened? Get that off of me. But it just seems stuck, you know, and you can't, like, how did this get attached to me? I don't like this. Most of the guys I've talked to in ARCs don't love their addiction. You know, it's uh, some temporary relief when you're feeling miserable, but they don't really want it. They want to be free. I would say most everybody in this room would love. Anybody like to be completely free from a desire to drink, a desire to drug? You know, that can happen. But if you're not careful, you know, your life will just keep collecting negativity, addictions, habits. But you know what? God wants you to be free. He's the way maker, like we just sang. He wants to set you free if you'll dare to open your heart. Jesus will set people free. You know, you try and you try and you try to untie what got tangled up, but 
you know, if you will really look to Jesus Christ, he will set you free and you can just get rid of that stuff. You know, instead of fooling with it year after year, decade after decade, do you believe that's possible? It's possible, but you got to go beyond outward religion. And you have to be courageous to open your heart up to God. I'd like to give you an opportunity tonight to open your heart up in a unique way. And you can do it right where you're sitting. You don't have to walk or come forward or anything like that. There's a, I, I believe God is speaking. And um, he just, he'll t he speaks through the still small voice. He doesn't say, hello, Ernie, this is God. Uh, I would love for you to go down the street and tell your neighbors down there that things are going to be okay. He doesn't do that. He just puts the impression on your heart. And when an impression comes to your heart or a thought comes to your mind, it's not necessarily you. Did you know there are thoughts in your mind and feelings in your heart? that aren't from you. The thoughts and feelings come from three places. I got my own. I can sit here and think, gosh, when this is over, I'd love to go get a milkshake. That's probably just me. You know, I, I mean, that's it. But then there's two other sources. There's the devil and demons can put thoughts in your head. Like, man, when I get out of here, I'm, I'm going to go tell Joe I'm not taking this anymore, and he better get the, out of my way. And, and, and I'm, I'm going to go, you know, push him around for what he did to me. That's probably not God telling you to mistreat somebody. That's probably not just you. That's probably the devil. And then God can also do it. I think I'll go and read the big book, or the really, I call this the really big book. This is the big book, and this is the really big book. They're both about opening your heart. The Bible is also about opening your heart. So God can, you know, say, you know, go, go back to your uh, dorm room, read the Bible. Uh, you know, call your mom. You hadn't talked to her in six weeks and tell your mom you love her. That's not the devil telling you to do that, is it? And that may not be you because you feel like your mom's looking down on you and you don't want to put any more burden on her, so you're not particularly wanting to call her, but the thought comes to call her, that's God. You, can, you hear from God all the time. Some people say, well, God won't talk to people if they're not Christians. God talks to all kinds of people. He, you, he talks to, he's talking, the, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. Well, on my walk, God was talking to me through those buildings. But sometimes he'll put something in my heart, a thought, uh, a feeling, a picture, an idea, uh, and it'll just come into my mind. And I'll usually say, is that the devil? You know, the thought, if the thought comes to uh, call a friend and offer to pray with him, I'm like, okay, that's not the devil. He didn't want me praying with a friend. Is that me? Now, I feel a little weird calling this guy until I'm asking him if I can pray for him, so it's not me. Well, then I just heard from God. So there's a story in the Bible about a little boy who heard from God. His name is Samuel, and he was eight or nine, I think, maybe a little older. Not, he was really young, pretty young, and he was living with a great prophet named Eli. And uh, Eli was not Samuel's father, but he was kind of like his guardian and was going to raise him to be a prophet. So one night, Samuel's in bed, and Eli has him go to bed, and Samuel hears something go, Samuel! And he's like... Well, must be Eli. And he goes in, Eli, what, what do you want? And Eli says, I don't want anything. He says, well, I heard somebody call my name. Well, you must have imagined it. Go back to bed. So he sends him back to bed. And that happens three or four times. Samuel will hear his name. And he comes into this prophet of God. And the prophet of God was so dense, he didn't even know who this God was trying to talk to the young man. And finally, about the fourth time, he says, that's God talking to you. Go back to bed, and when you, if you hear that voice again, that calling your name, say, "Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening." Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And so Samuel said that, and all of a sudden, this thought started coming to Samuel's mind uh, that Eli's two sons 
They, they had rebelled against the Lord. They were doing every wicked thing. And, and, and God started telling Samuel, these two young men were going to die in a battle that was coming. And he started revealing some things to Samuel and speaking to him. And then Samuel tells it to Eli. And Eli realizes that, you know, he has not tried to guide his sons. And anyway, God really moves. And I, when I was in the Nashville ARC, started uh, with guys right off the street. Guys had only been off the street for uh, a day to six weeks, uh, telling them the Samuel story and asking them if they had the courage to say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Do you, anybody have the courage to ask God that? You know, if, you, if you're unwilling to do that, God can't help you. It's just like the dentist. If you don't have the courage to... Our dentist can't help you unless you've got the courage to open your mouth. So I challenge you to do that. So I, I, the ARC guys, when I would say that, there'd be about 15 or 20 guys in the room, and, and, and at least a third of them would stand up and say, you know, this is what came to me. Just when you say, speak, Lord, whatever comes into your mind, or if a feeling comes into your heart, if a memory comes, if a picture comes, and you've asked God, that's probably God speaking to you. And then I've asked people to share it and just stand up and say, what did you hear? And so we've done that with ARC guys, and every time at least two or three guys are deeply moved. And they move me because when they share what God says, it touches my heart. There's nothing any more powerful and beautiful when somebody hears from God and it's the courage to share what they heard. You know why we think God's not talking? We have a society and churches full of religious cowards. They're afraid of God. So they're sitting in the dentist with their mouth closed. They're sitting in church with their heart closed. But you guys are not religious cowards. You're not Pharisees. You've been at the other side, and you know, just like the big book says, you need help, and you need to be fearless. Don't you know the 12 steps say, I took a fearless moral inventory, and I admitted my wrongs, my defects, my shortcomings. Have you had the courage to do that? If not, your heart is closed. It takes courage to stand up and say, you know, I did this and I did that and, and on and on uh, and to write it down and to reveal it to some person like the 12 steps say. But if all you do is read about it, you might as well burn the book because it's not going to do you any good. So I would like to, uh, maybe, you, you know, you don't have to raise your hand, but would you at least try this? You don't have to tell anybody. All I'm saying is just say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. I had a bunch of Salvation Army officers do this once. And they, when, when they, uh, we listened for about a minute, one lady came running down just weeping. And she had lost a grandchild of uh, a cancer. Uh, and we had walked through that with her off and on through the previous year praying with her. And she comes to the mic just weeping and weeping. And she said, uh, uh, when I asked God to speak, he, she said, all this last year since my granddaughter died, I, I've like been saying, God, why did you put me through that all this year? Why did you put me through that? And she said, when I said speak, God said to me, I didn't put you through it. I walked with you through it. The enemy is the one who causes, he came, the devil and his demons, wants to still kill and destroy, but she was weak, weeping. I, this was a Salvation Army uh, religious meeting they did every uh, you know, a couple of uh, months. I mean, twice a year. But I'd never seen any of the officers cry like that. So, uh, so uh, I, I'm going to pray, speak, Lord for your servant is listening and ask you to pray it with me, either out loud or you can pray silently. And then we're just going to sit quiet for about a minute. And if you're not willing to try this, how do you know it doesn't work? So I just encourage you, please be, be brave enough to try it.
and notice if anything comes to your mind. So would you say after me, and then I'm going to wait like 30 seconds or a minute, and then we'll see what happens. So would you pr say after me now a prayer from your heart? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And Lord, you've heard us. Lord, you've heard us uh, ask you to speak. And even the guys who didn't ask you to speak, Lord, I ask you to speak to them now. Amen. Uh, did you get something? No. Okay. Uh, well, I, I got something. Uh, right before, you know, we ended at first, nothing was coming to my mind. Uh, this came to my mind. I love these men so much. I died for them. I love them so much. I would go through it all again for them. And that's how God feels about you. Amen. So, you might have just heard a word, or you might have just gotten a picture of something. And so, if you did, just raise your hand and I'll just bring the mic around. It doesn't have to be anything magnificent or, you know, we're not going to clap or anything. Which you want us to. So, who got something interested? And if something came to your mind and you're not sure whether it was God or not, you can tell us and we'll help you figure it out. It's a no big deal if it was just your own thought. Well, just because you didn't get anything or you're unwilling to share it doesn't mean God didn't speak to you. It's not only he spoke to numerous of you, I guess it's a, you know, several of you, and pay attention to that thought. 
or that feeling, or that visual <coughs> because that could be the key for your recovery. Oh. I mean, I can't figure it out. I can't figure my life out. But when I try to make a mess, and I need God of your power, I mean, even I've been seeking Jesus for uh, many years, <coughs> and I still want more. more. You know, if you think, okay, I've got enough of God to get me recovered, to get sober, you don't have enough. Somebody said, how bad should you want God? You may, you may have heard this story. I guess then, this is how bad you need to seek God. And he takes it a friend, and he takes him out of the water, and he puts him under, and he puts it down, and just kind of waits. And the guy's squirming, and he's you know, trying to get up, and the guy's just holding it down. You know, like a long time. He didn't want to kill it, but it was close. And then he lets him up, and the guy, oh, 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 oh. and he's gasping. And he said, how bad did you want anger? I said, I've never wanted anger so bad. He said, that's how bad you need to want God. And when you want God that bad, you say you seek him, you're going to find him. Now, you know, I mean, we, we want these other things. We want our football team and we like to win the Super Bowl. And we throw all this time and energy just ridiculous. You know, it's fun, but in the long term, what does it matter? You know, we want a better job to make 5000 more a year. Go after it to get it. Okay, you might have a little better car, but in the long term, what does it matter? We seek all this stuff, but we don't seek Jesus. And if you start to see, there's more, more. There's so much more. And it comes from in here. It doesn't come from getting a recommendation to get you a job when you get out of here. It doesn't come from getting a fart. But it comes from letting Christ in you. The Bible gives all of the scripture. It says, Christ in you is the hope of glory. And when you let Christ, he's working like we were seeing. Uh, it's real. He never stops working. He's working. Something's happening inside of you. Day and night. It's just stirred up. This stuff just happens. And I, you know, and I, I, it's real. And I would think it wasn't if I didn't know other people who had similar experience. If I was the only one who felt like this about Jesus, I'd think I was crazy. But I meet strangers. And I'll find out. You know, we'll have a conversation and they say something about Jesus. So I, I love Jesus. Do you love him? And, and before, just like that, there's an instant relationship. We met this couple uh, two months ago. We'd never met. And all of a sudden, we found out we both loved, all four of us love Jesus. And it's like with you guys. But this was another couple we met. And all of a sudden, we're like best friends. We talk to them incredibly on the phone. They talk about how much they love us. Well, we've hardly ever been around them. But it's because of the spirit, this thing is real. And if you don't have the reality of Jesus inside of you, it, you're missing out on the best thing life has to offer. It's better than alcohol, better than drugs, better than sex, if you can believe that. It's amazing. And so that's what we all I get excited. <laughs> okay. Do you want to say something? No. Okay. Um, I just want to go back to where we were earlier about the Shen. Um, it's interesting this week. Um, I was in a Bible study, and that's exactly what we talked about. So that's my accident that you got that. Um, like I said, shame is something that. I, we see so many people deal with in life. And I mean, how many of you have felt shame about something? We all feel shame about something, <clears throat> even if we're not guilty. You notice that? Somebody else can do something, and suddenly we're dealing with shame ourselves because shame can get into us at a very early age. We know where it comes from. It's not from God, it's not from the Lord. But it's a powerful thing, and it can really take root. And be eaten alive, so to speak. And God wants you to be free of that. So I just want to say a prayer right now. If you would just close your eyes and you know, just receive, like, no, I'm going to pray, but you know, God knows. Lord, I just pray right now for this group of men. Lord, God, you love these men so much. 
You love them even more than we love our daughter. Lord, may you want freedom for them. And so, Lord, we just stand with them right now for their freedom. But, Lord, we ask that you help it begin now with just breaking off the spirit of shame that has gone deep. Every time there was a mistake made, every time there was a relapse, every time there was a bad decision, it wasn't just conviction from you, Lord, that told them to change, but it was a spirit of shame that came with it. And we just break that spirit of shame in Jesus' name. We tell it to come out in Jesus' name out of every man in this room, and we renounce it and say that shame can no longer have any hold over any person in this room. There is not room for shame in the kingdom of God, and freedom is what you have as a gift. And he says, let go of it, let it go now, that some of you have held on to it because it was familiar, and you bought into it many years ago, several years ago, you agreed. So we break any agreement right now that has been made in Jesus' name over the spirit of shame. Any agreement that said, I agree, I ought to be ashamed. We break that in Jesus' name. To change a behavior is different than walking in shame. And so we break the power of that over every man in this room right now in Jesus' name. And we say, from now on, when shame comes, it cannot stay. It may come, it may try to visit, but it's not welcome there now. In Jesus' name, we break the root of it wherever it started. Lord, I'll leave you know that, because every person is different in here. But we just break it now at the root and say it can no longer grow in there. It can no longer hide out. It can no longer torment in the middle of the night. It can no longer torment on Mother's Day and Father's Day and Christmas and Thanksgiving and all the special days where shame wants to come and wreak havoc in our lives and in our spirit. No more in Jesus' name. From now on, if it comes, we say, get out in Jesus' name because that is not what he has for you. And so we all agree now and just say and do yourself or out loud, I agree. I agree. In, Jesus name, In Jesus' name, there is no more shame over decisions I have made and things that I have done that I knew were not good. And I no longer agree that I am shamed. And we agree with that. And we say it has no more power over you. And if it comes, it's just the enemy trying to bring it back. And you can say, get out. In Jesus' name, it'll be gone that quickly. We break the torment in the middle of the night. We break the thoughts that try to come during the day. So the scripture says the arrows that fly during the day. And the plague that comes at noon. And the pestilence that stalks in darkness. We just say no more in shame in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I know you want to talk about what we're going to do on Saturday, maybe. Um, but we appreciate you. We appreciate your, your presence here and, and your. Um, and your willingness to come into this program. It's, it's one of the best things. Even if you came here unwillingly, even if you came on a court order, it's no accident you're here. And you're being prayed for by at least 30 people in Tennessee right now and in other, some other states. They are praying for you. Not just that you find Jesus, but that you find freedom. That's what life is supposed to be about, is freedom. And, and no more shame, no more guilt. Well, I don't know if you want to say what you have in mind for tomorrow. So no. I'm here, I'm here. Well, I'm here. Okay. I'm here. Um, I don't know what all you're doing tomorrow, but we just wanted to let you know that we'll be in here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. 
in this room, and we'll be here until noon. And if you want to come in, if a number of you come in, we'll do something as a group. Um, we won't preach at you, but we'll, you know, we'll do some sharing and prayer. And if you just want to come in and get one-on-one -on -one prayer, um, we would love to pray with you and just, you know, just hear about where you are and to just help you help you get through this and stuff. So we'll be here from nine to noon, and we would love to have you. And also, we'll do about five magic. Oh, and Steve's going to do about five of his illusions. If you want to come. <laughs> and he's actually gotten paid to do these, believe it or not. So if you want to come in and just do your thing, hang out, you know, and say a prayer, then you're more than welcome. So he'll be here, and the illusions will be here. And then tomorrow night, back here. Yeah, yeah so I, I really um, encourage uh, everyone, hopefully, even if you just want to stop in for a few minutes and get prayed for. That's, that's what they came here for, and they, they have, really have a heart to, to pray with you and to pray over you and, and just to, to share with you what's, what's on their hearts and to just encourage you and help you. So um, starting at 10 o'clock, like until lunchtime, okay, the chapel will be open. We'll be here um, ready to pray and talk with you. So I, just, like I said, I encourage you. It was just for, for a few minutes you want to stop in. Uh, please take advantage of this opportunity. And then uh, lunch will be over there once again, so you know. Um, I thank you to those of you who helped out Major Beast tonight with setting up for her event, and I know she'll probably need a few brothers to help tomorrow to take everything down. And then uh, dinner will be over there, pizza at dinner time, and then we'll be back here at 6 o'clock um, for our, our next meeting. And if it's as good as tonight was, what a blessing that was. So, so thank you so much for your ministry. And um, all right, enjoy the rest of your night. We'll see you tomorrow. Is this is this yours?